a guide to human conduct introduction morality is the foundation of sadhana that is spiritual practice it must however be remembered that morality or good conduct is not the culminating point of the spiritual march as a moralist one may set an ideal for other moralists but to do this is not something worth mentioning for a sadhak that is spiritual aspirant sadhana in its very start requires mental equilibrium this sort of mental harmony may also be termed as morality people often say i follow neither a religion nor rituals i abide by truth i harm nobody and i tell no lies this is all that is necessary nothing more need be done or learnt it should be clearly understood that morality is only an effort to lead a well knit life it will be more correct to define morality as a dynamic force rather than a static one because balance in the extroversial spheres of life is maintained by waging a pauseless war against all opposite ideas it is not an intro external equilibrium if the unbalanced state of mind takes a serious turn by pressure of external allurement and if the mental disturbance is found to be intense it is likely that the power for internal struggle may yield and consequently the external equilibrium the show of morality may at any moment break down that is why morality is no doubt not the goal not even a static force the morality of a moralist may disappear at any moment it cannot be said with any certainty that the moralist who has resisted the temptation of a bribe of 2 rupees would also be able to resist the temptation of an offer of 200000 rupees nevertheless morality is not absolutely valueless in human life morality is an attribute of a good citizen and it is the starting point on the path of sadhana moral ideals must be able to furnish human beings with the ability as well as the inspiration to proceed on the path of sadhana morality depends on one's efforts to maintain a balance regarding time place and person and therefore there may be differences in moral code but the ultimate end of moralism is the attainment of supreme bliss and therefore there should not be any possibility of any imperfections of relativity it cannot be said that the ultimate aim of human life is not to commit theft what is desirable is that the tendency to commit theft should be eliminated not to indulge in falsehood is not the aim of life what is important is that the tendency of telling lies should be dispelled from one's mind the sadhak starts spiritual practices with the principle of morality of not indulging in theft or falsehood the aim of such morality is attainment of such a state of oneness with brahma where no desire is left for theft and all tendencies of falsehood disappear in the sadhana of anand mark moral education is imparted with the ideal of oneness with brahma because sadhana is not possible without such a moral ideation sadhana devoid of morality will divert people again towards material enjoyments and at any moment they may use their mental power acquired with much hardship to quench their thirst for mere physical objects there are many who have fallen from the path of yoga or tantra sadhana and are spending their days in disrepute and infamy whatever little progress they achieved through forcible control of their instincts was lost in a moment's error in pursuit of mundane pleasures it must therefore be emphasized 
that even before beginning sadhana one must follow moral principles strictly those who do not follow these principles should not follow the path of sadhana otherwise they will bring about their own harm and that of others acharyas must have noticed that people of over selfish nature fear anand mark itself for fear of following its strict moral principles they are concerned that the spread of anand marg may inconvenience the fulfillment of their means selfish desires and therefore they malign the marg in an effort to conceal their own weakness and dishonesty but remember that those who are lacking in moral spirit do not deserve to be called human beings however hard they may try their tall talk alone cannot camouflage the meanness of their minds for a long time yam sadhana the first lesson of human conduct is yam sadhana we shall discuss all the aspects of yam sadhana you know that yam consists of five principles ahimsa satya ashteya brahmacharya and aparigraha the practice of these five principles achieves control by different processes the word sam yama in sanskrit means regulated conduct it should be clearly understood that sam yama does not imply destroying something or somebody ahinsa ahinsa means not inflicting pain or hurt on anybody by thought word or action this word is wrongly interpreted by many some so called learned persons in fact define the word ahinsa in such a manner that if one adheres to it strictly it is impossible to live not only in a society but also in forests hills and caves in such an interpretation of the term ahinsa not only is killing prohibited but even to fight a defensive fight is not allowed by tilling the land one may cause the death of innumerable insects and creatures under the earth's surface therefore the use of a plow is not permissible the followers of such an interpretation of ahimsa say that those who want to lead a religious life should not use the plow themselves but employ other low born people to do the same to save themselves from the sin of destroying life sugar must be poured into the bodies of the ants no matter whether human beings have food or not the poor must spare their blood from their bodies to save insects the born enemies of human beings this is no definition of ahimsa it merely causes confusion it is contrary to true dharma it is against the very laws of existence even The process of respiration involves the death of numberless microbes. They are all living beings and to save them one will have to stop breathing. The administration of medicines to the suffering will have to be stopped because such medicines cause the destruction of disease causing bacteria. If ahimsa is so interpreted where will such interpretations be able to stand? they will have to give up even filtered water because the process of filtration of water means destroying the insects that causes impurity it is also not possible to drink impure water because then it is likely that such microbes might die in the stomach in the post vedic area this type of ahimsa was practiced in india for a long period and as a result life for ordinary citizens become very miserable the populace viewed with fear the religious dominated by this so called ahimsa they were forced to accept an atheistic belief and they left the path of dharma devoid of any code of conduct and intent on giving first preference to their own selfishness such atheists became a burden to the society and to the world those who wanted to enforce the so called ahimsa influenced religion became 
impractical and impotent by nature thus there is a pressing need in the modern area in the modern age to rethink these historical facts from a new angle of vision this age was followed by another wherein another new definition of the word ahimsa was propagated according to this definition hinsa meant to cause pain to living beings but did not include the slaughter of animals for food this idea is very much mistaken if causing pain amounts to hinsa the slaughter of animals for food must also be called hinsa because the animals do not offer their heads willingly at the altar of death for their cause recently one more interpretation for this word has been heard it somewhat resembles the second definition described earlier but it even lacks the simplicity or sincerity of that interpretation according to this interpretation ahimsa means non violence or non application of force possibly it is this interpretation which has distorted most the meaning of ahimsa in all actions of life whether small or big the unit mind processes by surmounting the opposing forces life evolves through the medium of force if this force is not properly developed life becomes absolutely dull no wise person would advocate such a thing because this would be contrary to the very fundamentals of human nature the champions of non violence so called ahimsa have therefore to adopt hypocrisy and falsehood whenever they seek to use this so called ahimsa for their purposes if the people of one country conquer another country by brute force the people of the defeated nation must use force to regain their freedom such a use of force may be crude or subtle and as a result both the body and mind of the conquerors may be hurt when there is any application of force it cannot be called non violence is it not violence if you hurt a person not by your hands but by some other indirect means is the boycott movement against a particular nation not violence Therefore I say that those who interpret non-violence and ahimsa to be synonymous have to repeatedly resort to hypocrisy to justify their actions the army or police are necessary for administration of a country if these organizations do not use force even in case of necessity this existence will be of no meaning the existence will be of no meaning The mark of so called ahimsa or non violence on a bullet does not make the bullet non violent those who are not adequately equipped to oppose an evil doer should make every endeavor to gain power and then make the proper use of this power in the absence of ability to resist evil and in the absence of even an effort to acquire such ability declaring oneself to be non violent in order to hide one's weaknesses before the opponent may serve a political end but it will not protect the sanctity of righteousness the meaning of the word ahimsa in the sphere of sadhana has already been explained according to its correct meaning one will have to guide one's conduct carefully to ensure that one's thought or actions cause pain to nobody and are unjust to none any thought or action with the intention of causing harm to someone else amounts to hinsa the existence of life implies destruction of certain lower forms no matter whether there is intention of doing harm or not the process of respiration kills thousands of millions of protoplasmic cells whether one knows it or not in every action such living cells are dying and being destroyed the use of prophylactics means destruction of millions of disease carrying germs the crop eating insects parasites mosquitoes bugs spiders etc are also being killed in innumerable ways this is necessary to maintain one's livelihood it is not with the intention of causing pain to them such acts also therefore cannot be classed as hinsa 
they are to be done for self defense as a result of clash and coercion within the physical structure of every entity and also for the maintenance of structural solidarity at every moment a process of formation and deformation is always taking place rice is obtained from paddy is there no life in paddy paddy can sprout it is also capable of reproduction for the preservation of the physical body you prepare rice by killing the paddy do you have any intention to harm anybody while preparing rice it is thus seen that life depends on other forms of life for its very existence there is no question of hinsa or ahinsa here if this is conceived as hinsa living beings will have to subsist on bricks sand and stone even breathing will have to be stopped or one will have to commit suicide it is however very necessary to remember two things in respect of edibles first as far as possible articles of food must be selected from amongst those items in which development of consciousness is comparatively little that is if vegetables are available animals should not be slaughtered secondly under all circumstances before killing any animal having developed or underdeveloped consciousness it must be considered whether it is possible to live in a healthy body without taking such lives the human body is constituted of innumerable living cells these cells develop and grow with the help of similar living entities The nature of your living cells will be formed in accordance with the type of food you take. Ultimately, all those together will affect your mind to some extent. If the cells of the human being grow on rotten and bad smelling food or on the fresh flesh of animals in which mean tendencies predominate, it is but natural that the mind will have a tendency of meanness. The policy of eating without due consideration whatever is available cannot be supported in any case even though there may not be any question of hinsa or ahinsa it should not be your policy to do what you wish you must perform actions after due thought for continued subsistence a policy will have to be adopted for taking food otherwise it will be against the code of aparigraha what aparigraha means will be explained later hinsa and the use of force are not identical sometimes the use of force may result in hinsa even though there is no thought in the mind to cause pain when the pressure of circumstances compels the use of force against certain individuals resulting in hinsa such individuals are termed as atatai in sanskrit anyone who by the use of brute force wants to take possession of your property abducts your wife comes with a weapon to murder you wants to snatch away your wealth sets fire to your house or wants to take life by administering poison is called an atatai if any person or a nation wants to occupy all or part of another country the use of physical force against such invading forces is not against the principle of ahinsa rather by a wrong interpretation of the term ahinsa or by interpreting hinsa and brute force as identical common people will have to suffer from loss of wealth happiness or other hardships sometimes it so happens that people instead of convincing superstitious people ensure their sentiments by their behavior a perusal of history shows that the antagonists of idolatry have on many occasions destroyed beautiful temples which were unique examples of architecture they destroyed the beautiful images which represented the expressions of sculptural art all these acts are extremely violent because they cause severe pain to the idolaters and consequently the idol worshippers adopt an abstinent attitude towards idols even though they are fully convinced that idol worship is futile as a result not only is the spiritual progress of the idol worshippers hampered but the progress of the whole human society is retarded 
it is worth noting that even if in any country all the people without exception give up idolatry the spiritual aspirants who follow the principles of brahmacharya will preserve images carefully in museums out of appreciation for sculpture and aesthetic taste they will not destroy these beautiful works in any circumstances destroying a work of art also results in the destruction of the sense of subtle appreciation and this is no way proper while the mind is still attached to religious or sectarian signs or submits to superstitious rituals it remains engrossed in crude objects any crude method to prevent such sectarian superstitions will cause reactions in the mind and this will hamper sadhana the best course therefore is to help these persons to expand their minds by means of brahma bhavana brahma bhavana cosmic ideation and only in that case will they be able to give up superstitions easily the principle of ahimsa one of the aspect of brahma sadhana must have been clearly understood now let us now consider whether parents pushing punishing a child amounts to hinsa or ahimsa no it is not hinsa because there is no intention of causing harm or pain at all the purpose of such punishment is not to make the child shed tears the purpose of such action is only correction whether it is a thief or a robber or a gentleman or a friend or anybody else any action with a true spirit of rectification cannot be termed as hinsa no matter how harsh it may seem it must now be clear that in day to day life it is not at all difficult to follow the path of true ahimsa taking meat as food is harmful in hot countries especially where vegetables are available in abundance however under medical advice as a diet after recovery from illness or as one of the constituents of medicine eating meat cannot be called either a either hinsa or greed because the meat is eaten under those circumstances only to maintain life in extremely cold countries people eat animal flesh wear animal skins and burn animal fat under the pressure of necessity heroism is revealed in fight against aggressors consider the ramayana the great epic it describes shri ram waging a war with all his might against ravana who abducted his wife shri ram's action was in no way against the principle of ahimsa because he did not invade lanka with any desire to conquer the territory or to cause harm consider the mahabharata mahapurans shri krishna has insisted to the pandavas to take up arms against the kauravas because the kauravas were aggressors who had taken possession of the land by force no one would accuse the very incarnation of love shriman mahaprabhu one of the great revolutionists in the social and spiritual world of adopting ways associated with hinsa but he too pounced like a lion on the tyrant kazi if hinsa and use of force were synonymous mahaprabhu the incarnation of mercy certainly would not have done so the use of force against an aggressor is velour and desisting from such use of force is cowardice but the weak people must assess their strength before indulging in violent conflict with a powerful aggressor otherwise if a fight is started without acquiring proper strength injustice may temporarily triumph in history such an error has been called rajput folly the rajputs always went forward with courage to resist mughal invasion no doubt they fought valiantly but they faced the enemy without assessing their own strength they suffered from intrigues and internal dissensions and hence they always lost battles and died a heroic death 
It is therefore necessary to acquire adequate strength before declaring a war against an aggressor. To pardon aggressors before correcting their nature means encouraging injustice. Of course, if you find that the aggressor is bent on destroying you, whether you use force or not, it would be proper to die at least giving a blow to the best of your might without waiting to assemble the adequate forces. Satya Satya implies proper action of mind and the right use of words with the spirit of welfare. It has no English synonym. The word true or truth would be translated in Sanskrit as rata to state the fact. The sadhak is not asked to follow the path of rata. One is to practice satya. The practical side of satya is dependent on relativity but its finality lies in Param Brahma, the supreme spiritual entity. That is why Brahma is often referred to as the essence of Satya. Even though the objective of a sadhak is to achieve that ultimate entity, in the process sadhak have to deal with the relativity of the surroundings. Humans are rational beings. They possess is in varying degrees the capability to do what is necessary or good for humanity. In the realm of spirituality, such thought, word of action has been defined as Satya. For example, a person rushes to you for shelter. You do not know whether he is guilty or not, or perhaps you know for certain that he is not guilty. He is followed by a ruffian bent or torturing him. If this terrified man seeks refuge in your house and then the ruffian comes and asks you regarding his whereabouts, what should you do? By adhering to Rata or Truth, you would inform the ruffian of his whereabouts. Then, if he is murdered, you will not be responsible for this murder. Your mistake may have resulted in the murder of an innocent person. By adhering to Rata or Truth, you become indirectly guilty of his heinous crime. Would, what would be your duty if you followed the correct interpretation of Satya? It would not to reveal the whereabouts of the person and rather to misguide the aggressor so that the refuge may safely return home. Suppose your mother is taking food. A letter is received about the death of your maternal grandfather. If mother inquires about the contents of the letter, what reply will you give? If you adhere to truth, you will reveal the news of her father's death, which will cause a great shock to her mind and she would not even be able to take her food. It would be preferable in this case to state that all is well in their family. After your mother has had her food, a mention of her father's illness would prepare the ground for her to bear the news of the tragedy. In this way, even though something other than truth was uttered, the dignity of Satya has been maintained. Asteya Not to take possessions, what belongs to others is asteya. It means non-stealing. Stealing may be of four types. Number one, physical theft of any material object. Ordinarily, those persons who steal material objects are called thieves. But thieves are not only those persons who flee with stolen objects after committing armed robbery. Whatever is taken in possession by the use of brute physical force, of arms or of strength of intellect, whether it is money or goods, amounts to theft because behind such actions, there is the interaction intention of taking others' property deceitfully. However, acceptance of anything like money, crops, gold, etc. in exchange for money in a proper way is not theft. Number 2. Psychic Theft Here, you did not take material possession of anything, but you planned it in your mind. This also called theft because you have mentally stolen. Only the fear of law or of adverse criticism prevented you from doing the action physically. Third, depriving others of their due physically. 
even if you do not take possessions of what belongs to others but you deprive others of what is their due you become responsible for this loss this is also stealing and lastly fourth depriving others of their due mentally if you do not actually deprive anybody of what is justifiable their due but you plan in your mind to do so that too amounts to theft some explanations here is necessary regarding the third and fourth type of theft referred to above you may have seen that many educated people travel by train without purchasing proper tickets they do not directly steal money from the railway administration but they deprive the railway administration for its due a little thought will repeal that reveal that there is a sort of barter relationship of the passengers and the railway administration and therefore ticketless travel amounts to theft of the type referred to under 3 and 4 above those who travel by train have obtained the facility from the railway administration by purchasing tickets they pay for that facility in full and consequently the railway administration cannot be held in high esteem for rendering a social service when the railway is not rendering free services not to pay one's travelling fare is theft consider for a moment what type of person commits such a theft for a few rupee only often people of the type indulge in all types of tall talks freely criticize the leaders and accuse them of corruption and nepotism if their shortcoming is pointed out they plead it is difficult to live in the world with such strict morality those who run the railway administration in such a manner deserves it this type of theft is justified missionaries or ascetics who convey a divine message or political leaders with the noble purpose of doing good to the country are seen to be often indulging in ticketless travel this is a daily occurrence bribing government employees to evade income and other taxes or demanding traveling allowance for a higher class when they actually travel in a lower class these are all nothing but cheating it is not only theft it is also pettiness All these tendencies to steal are contradictory to the code of Asteya. Asteya. In many cases, even educated people often act knowingly against the principle of Asteya or do not want to accept that petty stealing violates it. The author was once questioned by a by an acquaintance who was a railway employee. as to why he had purchased a full ticket for a nephew aged 13 years when a half ticket might have done half tickets being permitted up to the age of 12 only there are some more moralists who do not want to cheat any particular individual but do not consider anything wrong in cheating the well to do or to the government many a shopkeeper would sell adulterated commodities to his customers but entertain his own friends and guests with genuine items it should be remembered that all actions with such a psychological background are against a stay the easiest way of practicing a stay as in the case of all other principles of yam and niyam is auto suggested if people right from the childhood remember these codes and remember themselves what is correct they will not go astray when they grow up even in the midst of temptations and they will be able to maintain the high standard of thoughts and character brahmacharya the correct meaning of brahmacharya is to remain attached to brahma whenever people do some work or think of doing any work extroversially they look upon the object with which they come in contact as a crude finite entity because of their constant aspiration for material achievements their mind is so engrossed in material objects that their very consciousness becomes crude the meaning of practicing brahmacharya sadhana is to treat the object with which one comes in contact as different expressions of brahm and not as crude forms by means of such an ideation even though the mind wanders from one object to another it does not get detached from brahma 
because of the cosmic feeling taken for each and every object as a result of this preya sadhana extroversial approach is converted into shreya sadhana introversial approach and come into prema preya means attraction towards crude material objects while shreya means attraction towards the ultimate reality kama means desire for finite objects and prema means desire for the infinite many interpretations brahmacharya to mean preservation of semen it should be remembered that neither the word brahma nor the word karya has any relevance to the word semen moreover even psychologically such a preservation of semen is a bluff either owing to the disease in certain glands or by the use of similar other possesses unless one becomes maimed it is not possible to observe such brahmacharya it is certainly true that if the correct meaning of the word brahmacharya is accepted that is to feel the cosmic entity in every material object control in life becomes essential but such control does not imply disobeying the laws of nature control means to abide by nature's laws the prevention of the discharge of semen by some special measures or prevention of its surplus formation by fasting is ordinarily termed as so called brahmacharya for those who are not married this so called brahmacharya which is really not brahmacharya has some meaning because it reduces the possibility of sexual excitement and thus prevents a discharge which may occur due to excitement while awake asleep as or dreaming this is because when there is no formation of surplus semen there is no physical desire to waste it further consideration will however show what this so called brahmacharya is worth are the prevention of formation of surplus semen and the loss of surplus semen not one and the same thing all that can be said is that the first alternative is good for the unmarried and the second for the married people who by different suppressive methods seek to prevent the discharge of semen create a bad reaction on their body and mind their bodies become rough and lack in luster a suppression of the sexual desire results in other desires especially anger taking a more terrible form in the olden times only the actual meaning of brahmacharya was accepted later when society was dominated by the intelligentsia the so called monks who had taken to complete exploitation thought that if ordinary citizens were allowed to pursue spiritual practices they might lose the machinery of exploitation at any moment of which they were so fond if common people are inspired by spiritual ideals their rationality will grow and grow the monks realized therefore that the people will have to be kept maimed and helpless fear and inferiority complex will have to be infused in people to exploit them they found that such an exploited mass consisted of ordinary worldly people most of whom were married if therefore the loss of semen was anyhow declared as anti religious they would be able to gain their end without difficulty and the result was promptly achieved ordinary worldly people began to think that they by leading a married life had committed a serious wrong a heinous sin they had indulged in activities against brahmacharya the monks observed celibacy and were therefore far superior the so called recluses took advantage of the situation and have without difficulty been exploiting the society whether these recluses in fact are nisthika brahmacharis those who do not weigh semen at all cannot be decided by arguments this can be decided by medical test but it can be said without doubts that many of the so called monks will not pass this test marriage is a natural function like bath food sleep etc 
therefore there is nothing to be condemning in it nor does it go against dharma when a great man or an elevated sadhak is not prohibited from taking food etc there is no reason why he or she should be debarred from marriage but proper control is no doubt greatly needed not only over food and sleep but in every walks of life the lack of such control causes disease food is essential for life but absence of control over eating causes indigestion a bath is refreshing but in absence of control over bath that is a long continued bath would make one catch cold similarly marriage has its function but the absence of restraint in marriage life would cause various diseases in body and mind marriage is slightly different from other natural functions in life such as eating sleeping etc marriage is not so essential for life as are food and sleep the need for marriage differs with individuals that is why in the opinion of anand mark every individual has complete freedom in matters of marriage for example marriage of those person who suffer from some physical or mental disease or who are not financially well off or whose present circumstances are not favorable for marriage that is where marriage can cause unhappiness is not desirable those who are constantly engaged in the fulfillment of an ideal or those who have to spend the greater part of their day in earning their livelihood or some mental occupations should not marry because they will not find it possible to fulfill their family commitments properly the marriages of such people are harmful to the society in many cases although marriage is not desirable for those who are suffering from some diseases or whose circumstances are not favorable to get married there remains a possibility of their indulging in vices stealthiness if they are not married to avoid this they should work for the attainment of some high ideals or do rigorous spiritual practices the psychological degeneration which is inherent in the suppression of psychic tendencies can be avoided only by an effort to fulfill a lofty ideal it has been said earlier and it is being repeated that one has to exercise control in every sphere of life whether big or small such control does not employ killing the desire but controlling it desires and tendencies are natural attributes of a living being therefore those who want to kill the desires should better adopt some easy methods of committing suicide instead of pursuing any difficult method of spiritual practices I do not find any reason to support the so-called brahmacharya for those who are shaiva or who believe in purans because their deities Shiva, Vishnu, Krishna and others were what is commonly known as worldly people. In puran the names of their wives and children are also mentioned. Dharma is based on satya where there is no satya there is no dharma this peculiar interpretation of brahmacharya may contain anything and everything save except satya hence there is no dharma or brahm in it humanity has to progress towards the ultimate reality by accepting what is truth that is the path of a sadhak that is the path of dharma it may be a privilege to parasitic religious professionals to deny what is simple truth in practical life but thereby the sanctity of dharma cannot be maintained it is not the path of satya it is nothing but hypocrisy a parigraha in case of enjoyment of any material object the control over the subjectivity is called brahmacharya while the control over objectivity is a parigraha non indulgence in the enjoyment of such amenities and comforts of life as are superfluous for the preservation of life is a parigraha for our existence we require food 
clothes and also a house to live in provisions for old age and money and cultivable land for one's dependents are also essential therefore a number of factors have to be taken into consideration to determine an individual's necessity for the preservation of life it may be that the requirements of any two persons are not similar it is therefore difficult to determine the minimum requirements for any particular person because it is entirely a relative factor the minimum requirement of a person can to some extent be determined and decided by the society for example no one shall accumulate more than a certain amount of money or no one shall possess more than a certain number of houses or no one shall be owner of more than a certain area of landed property but it is not possible for the society to fix the minimum limit in all spheres even after setting a limit for land property etc it is not possible to fix a quota in respect of edibles the vocations may overeat and be attacked with diseases the seekers of luxury may overspend on their luxuries and incur debt that is why it will be easier for an individual to be established in a parigra if the individual and the society work together cooperatively those items of personal requirement which are left to the discretion of the individual largely depends on the conception of that individual's happiness and comforts this also changes according to time person and place for example one person may easily bear certain physical hardships while another person under the same situation may possibly die under these circumstances the latter requires greater comforts of life than the former to remove his or her difficulty and this will not be against a parigraha the place is to be considered also in the summer season in india woolen clothing is unnecessary but it is necessary in siberia during that time time should be considered also the minimum necessity of an ordinary person today is not limited to the minimum necessity of an ordinary person in prehistoric age the reason is that the objects of pleasures are more easily available today and will be available even more easily in the future therefore while practicing a parigraha if the time factor is neglected one will become unfit for social life and will have to withdraw from the physical world advocating the use of raw sugar that is gur in the age of sugar and bullock cart in the age of railways has no meaning in the practice of a parigraha today for an ordinary person whose time is not more valuable than that of another traveling by aeroplane is definitely contrary to a parigraha whereas traveling by rail is certainly not against a parigraha that is why i said that the society may help individuals to be established in a parigraha by setting a standard in certain spheres of life but the complete establishment in a parigraha ultimately depends on the individual a parigraha is an endless fight to reduce one's own objects of comforts out of sympathy for the common people after ensuring that individuals are able to maintain solidarity in their physical mental and spiritual lives for themselves and their families in practicing a parigra the objects of pleasure will increase or decrease with person place and time but the definition of a parigra as mentioned above will be applicable to all persons in all countries and at all times how to live in the society the establishment of an ideal society depends on the mutual help of the members and their cooperative behavior this cooperative behavior depends on the practice of the principles of yam and niyam so spiritual practices especially the practice of yam and niyam are the sound foundations of an ideal society it is often noticed that individuals incur debt because of their violating the principles of yam and niyam especially due to their extravagance 
and as a result they approached the society for relief in this connection i must point out that just as the society is duty bound to give relief to individuals by combined effort so also it must have control over the conduct of individuals over their practice of the principles of yam and niyam and also over their expenditure not to consult anybody at the time of spending money but to ask for help from all when in debt is not a good practice such a mentality cannot be encouraged to purchase by incurring debt search where treed will do or gabardine where surge will do is surely against the principle of a parigra similarly people should take food which is nutritious but not rich they have to give up the practice of feeding others with money taken on loan that is why social control over the individual's conduct and expenditure is indispensable necessary hence all anand margis when they see other margis acting against the principles of yam and niyam must make them shun this habit either by sweet or harsh words or by dealing even more strictly thus they will have to make the society strong henceforth i direct every anand margi to keep strict vigilance on other anand margi to make them practice the principle of yam and niyam and also to accept calmly directions of other margis in this connection i am also giving one more advice in regard to a parigra if any margi have to spend on anything in addition to the fixed expenditure for example expensive clothing ornaments articles of furniture marriage building etc they should before incurring such expenditure obtain a clear order from their acharya unit secretary or district secretary or any other person of responsible rank similarly permission is to be obtained before taking loan from any businessman or money lender where one's own acharya or any person of responsible rank is not easily available consultation or rather permission is to be obtained from any other acharya or any right thinking member of the marg every member should follow this instruction strictly niyam sadhana the initial phase of the yogika cult is the practice of yama this has already been explained today's discourse will be on the practice of niyam the practice of brahmacharya is held in higher esteem than the other four items of yama similarly in niyama the most important item is ishwar paridhan to be more clear and concrete we may say that out of the 10 principles of yam and niyam the remaining 8 are subordinated parts of the two items brahmacharya and ishwar paridhan while dealing with this specialities we may say that yam sadhana is the practice of the physical and psychic strata while the niyam sadhana carries equal weight in mundane supra mundane and spiritual strata shauch the first aspect of niyam sadhana is shauch it means purity or cleanliness it can be subdivided into two parts one relating to external sphere that is external cleanliness and the other to mental sphere that is internal cleanliness the proper use of soap water or other cleansers to keep the body clothes or surroundings clean is external cleanliness by this cleanliness the physical objects with which people are directly associated are cleaned and made fit for use when people driven by instincts direct their mental stuff blindly towards the objects of pleasure without taking any help from their conscience or when mind ultimately gets crudified by being constantly goaded by selfish motives whether or not they think of doing harm to other their minds get distorted the complexes by which this distortion occurs are the dirts of the mind 
For example, if any acquaintance suddenly earns much name, fame or knowledge, many will develop a feeling of jealousy towards him. People suffer from mental trouble at the prosperity of others. They do not give the least thought as to how much potentiality they themselves possess to earn those things or to acquire those qualities. Though that fortunate person did no harm to them, yet being overpowered by jealousy, they create trouble for or think ill of him or her. Where selfish interest is hampered, the minds of even the so-called honest people also become distorted within a very short time. Just as one's clothes and houses get dirty very quickly in a dust storm, so also the mind becomes much more polluted by the storms of even insignificant passion in much less time. Therefore, it is necessary to maintain the cleanliness of body, dress and house, but the need to keep the mind clean is still greater. Cleansing the mind is a far more laborious job than cleansing the body, clothes, house, etc. Intelligent people should not therefore allow their mental purity to be stained. You must always guard against the tempest of passion. You must not yield to short storms. One more difference between external and internal cleanliness is that to remove external dirt, while cleansing the body, clothes or houses, one has to come in contact with impurities for some time. But in the mental sphere, the cleansing process does not require your coming in contact with any filth. The application of force is necessary to remove the impurities. The weight of the actual gold can be determined only by removing the impurities from the gold. The application of force must be a special type of action. External shorch is an external activity and mental shorch is an internal activity. If the impurity of selfishness, which by entering into every cavity of the mental body, makes it weak, makes life a heavy burden, it has to be removed, it has to be burnt and melted in the fire of sadhana. Such sadhana is just the opposite of mean and selfish sadhana. It is such that no impurity, no black spot remains in the mind. The feeling of selfishness, the feeling of universalism is the only remedy to remove mental impurities. People who have fascination or temptation for any mental object can gradually remove their mental pollution arising out of selfish motives by adopting just the reverse course. Those who are very greedy for money should form the habit of charity and they can serve humanity through such a practice. Those who are angry or egoistic should cultivate the habit of being polite and they should see serve humanity through that practice. Therefore, only selfless service to humanity and the efforts to look upon the world with the cosmic outlook alone can lead to establishment in mental shorts. Human beings desire to acquire things from others known no bounds. These hopes are never quenched, but their spirit of giving to others is very mirage. Generally, when people do give something to others, the intention of charity or service is absolutely secondary. Their predominant feeling is to receive something in exchange. In other words, they have extreme greed to garner fame by one hand and give charity by the other. A sadhak will have to adopt the opposite course to get rid of the burning flames of greed. He or she will have to develop an infinite desire to give to others with no intention at all of obtaining anything from them. You will have to establish yourselves in the realm of infinity by smashing the fetters of unit ego. You must have seen many people who become angry and sorrowful at the time of his distress saying, I help those persons in their adversity, serve them so much on their sick bed, but today they are so ungrateful that they do not even cast a glance at me. They may even curse, God is witnessing everything, they will have to reap the consequences of their actions. You know that such remarks are an extremely vulgar expressions of mental meanness. 
such persons have not done sadhana for mental purification nor have they truly served anybody in adversity or sickness in fact they took advantage of other people's distress and gave them some assistance as an advance but the motive behind such assistance was to recover it with full interest a question may be raised as to how much people should donate for short sadhana should they make propers of themselves where services is the goal people should fully observe a parigra acquiring only the bare necessities of life for themselves and their direct dependents without which they cannot live and utilize the rest for the collective welfare of the universe but one who is dedicated to an idol must be prepared to gladly and eagerly give up one's all even one's life for the collective interest even in a house where food is not abundant you should keep something for the residents of the house to appease their hunger and donate the rest to the needy in this case thinking of the residents necessities is not narrowness or meanness because the preservation of life is certainly very important through not the ultimate aim When one is fighting for an ideal however to accept defeat means to plunge in severe gloom where there is not the least possibility to remove the gloom one will have to sacrifice everything to uphold one's ideal you should always be ready like an armed soldier to meet such exigencies santosh tosha means the state of mental ease santosh therefore means a state of proper ease contentment is not at all possible if the individual is running after carnal pleasures like a beast as a result of extroversial analysts the objects of enjoyments go on increasing both in number and abstraction and that is why one's mental flow never gets any rest under such circumstances how can one attain perfect peace of mind achieving the desired objects may give one pleasure for an hour or so but that will not last long the mind will again run in pursuit of new objects leaving behind the objects already tasted the long cherished objects will lose their importance this is the rule this is the law of nature human desire knows no end Millionaires want to become multimillionaires because they are not satisfied with their million. Ask the millionaires if they are happy with their money, they will say, "Where is the money? I am somehow pulling on." This answer indicates their ignorance of a parigraha. But such feelings have another adverse effect on body and mind. Out of excessive fondness for physical or mental pleasures, people become mad to earn money. and amass wealth as money becomes the be all and end all of life the mind gets crudified constant hankering after money results in negligence of one's health and this makes the body unfit therefore santosh sadhana lies in being contented with the earnings of normal labor without any undue pressure on the body and mind to remain contented one has to make a special type of mental effort to keep aloof from external allurements you are aware that there are two effective methods to detach the mind from tendencies one is auto suggestion and the other outer suggestion if anybody always tries to think thoughts just opposite to the main tendencies which occupied the mind a charge is one's nature is bound to occur a change in one's nature is bound to occur this is auto suggestion a change in one's nature is also brought about if such ideals are repeatedly conveyed to one's ears by some external agents this is called auto suggestion in the case of santosh sadhana the aspirant must always follow auto suggestion Santosh sadhana does not imply that you should allow yourself to be exploited or oppressed by someone who takes advantage of your simplicity and you should tolerate it silently it is by no means proper for you to give up your right of self preservation or your legitimate dues in life 
you have to go on fighting with concerted efforts for the establishment of your rights but you must never violate the principle of santosh by wasting your physical and mental energy under the sway of excessive greed tap tap means to practice penance to reach the goal to practice sauch it is not necessary to undergo physical discomfort to serve humanity a donation of 10 rupee brings no physical discomfort for millionaires it is therefore not tap for them but this gift helps them in practicing mental sauch there must be one and only one purpose behind the practice of penance and that is to shoulder sorrows and miseries of others to make them happy to free them from grief and to give them comforts just like short sadhana in the practice of tapa there must not be even the least bit of commercial mentality physical service is almost all cases in almost all cases relates to tapa therefore those who are afraid of who are afraid of physical labor or hate the shudra laborers can never become a tapasa If you serve sick people who are in great pain for hours together to give them needed relief this is tap but if you serve them with the selfish motive of securing their assistance in your bad days the entire effort of tap is lost in a moment tap sadhana is therefore to be above selfishness as a rule practice of tap will lead to mental dilation and this dilation will certainly help a sadhak to a large extent in practicing ishwar paridhan the sadhak of tap knows that the served is brahma their cherished goal they are servants and the service renders by them in their sadhana the very purpose of tapas of those who are ready themselves to render service to the served only after consideration of their caste creed religion or nationality is defeated because it is not possible for them to serve with due sincerity with such a lack of large heartedness those who look upon the served only as an expression of the cosmos and look after their comforts selflessly develop devotion or love for the supreme in a short time when love is aroused and devotion sentiment is expressed what else remains to be achieved what place does knowledge or reasoning occupy in tap sadhana this is a very important question truly speaking far greater knowledge is required to render service pertaining to tap than to render service pertaining to shauch tap devoid of knowledge is bound to be misused the opportunists will misuse your energy by extracting work from you to serve their selfish ends and at the same time they will deprive the real sufferers of their due services from you a rich miser approaches you with a tale of woe and entreats you to give him relief being moved with pity if you do what is needed to relieve him in suffering the very purpose of tap will be defeated as it is without any knowledge of reasoning the end result of your service will be that the rich man whom you have served will become more misery and more selfish and will in the future try to deceive in a greater way people who dedicate themselves to the service of humanity secondly as you will to some extent know his inner motive you will become mentally depressed and you will also develop a hostile attitude towards him therefore while following the principle of tap you should ascertain fully well whether the person you are going to serve really needs your service only then should you engage yourself in service in practicing tap you should always give consideration to those who are inferior to you and not to those who are superior your responsibility is greater for those who are weaker poorer less educated more ignorant and downtrodden in comparison with you your responsibility is very little for those who are above your level who are better off and more powerful than you 
therefore you will have to ascertain with discrimination where your responsibility lies and to what extent otherwise all your time energy and labor employed in tap will be in vain to banquet the rich is of no use give food to the starving there is no need to send presents to your superiors send medicines and food to the sick don't waste your time in flattering the rich it will yield no result conquer the hearts of the underprivileged by your sympathetic behavior and accept them in your society you cannot attain brahm by tap if it is devoid of discrimination because in such cases you do not make the proper use of objects of course it is better to do something than nothing and with this end in view tap even without discrimination has some value it has some psychological benefits buddha said win the miser by charity win the liar by speaking the truth you can definitely influence a miser by your charity and there is nothing bad in this but it is not what is understood by the term tap there is another peculiarity in tap where the activities of human beings are not guided by discrimination they are guided by instinct tap with discrimination charges the course of action and leads people towards emancipation of course devotion also gives rise to discrimination but such devotion cannot be aroused in those who have not experienced cosmic bliss swadhyay swadhyay means the clear understanding of any spiritual subject in ancient days students carried on their day to day swadhyay in the hermitage of the rishis but the circumstances have changed and the term swadhyay has also lost its meaning with pa- with passage of time nowadays reading religious scriptures without grasping the meaning is also considered to be swadhyay religious professionals have misguided the public by their misinterpretation of the term swadhyay they say these are the results of reading such and such books it matters little whether you understand the meaning or not if you cannot find time to read books simply touch your head with them thrice or if you have no time to hear religious sermons offer fruits or sweets to the deity this will yield the same result this is the real thing swadhyay means not only to read or hear a subject but also to understand its significance the underlying idea acceptance of the outward or crude meaning has only led to the corruption of vainava and shaktva sadhana i'm sorry i'm not able to pronounce these two words actually and this ultimately greatly distorted people's religious belief for example one aspect of tantra sadhana is called mamsa sadhana what is this mamsa sadhana ma means tongue and mamsa means action of the tongue that is vocal expression the sadhak who takes mamsal vocal expression every day that is who practices control over speech is a mamsa sadhaka how beautiful the meaning is but the so called interpreters who are dominated by their material desires never hesitate to slaughter innocent goats at the altar of the deities in the name of mamsa sadhana that is meat sadhana the number of goats to be sacrificed is determined by the number of those who will eat the flesh alas what an interpretation to understand the underlying meaning of what is laid down in scriptures the idea is to be grasped first otherwise the proper spirit will never be realized if i say shondika suralagayam gachati it will naturally mean the liquor merchant is going to the liquor shop but if i say narada suralayam gachati it means Narad is going to the adobe of heaven. I'm sorry, I may be pronouncing the Sanskrit words incorrectly and I'm extremely sorry for that. But in the former case, it was the house of Sura, that is 
liquor shop thus the same word carries different meanings in different contexts you have now understood how cautious you have to be in practicing swadhyay those with vested interest seek to keep the public away from the true spirit of the true shastras because this facilitates their exploitation ishwar paridhan there may be many interpretations of the term ishwara but it commonly means the controller of this universe he who controls the thought waves of the universe is ishwara therefore purushottam and ishwar are not identical conceptions in philosophy the word ishwar has one more meaning it is the witnessing counterpart of the objective prakriti where the static principle is dominant it is the witnessing entity of the casual world it is the magnified essence of prajna it is an entity free from all bondages whatever may be the minor difference to a sadhak ishwar is understood to be nothing other than saguna brahma or god paridhan means to understand clearly or to adopt something as a shelter therefore ishwar paridhan means to establish oneself in the cosmic idea to accept ishwar as the only ideal of life the physical body constituted of five fundamental factors does not disobey the laws of the cycles of his thought wave extroversial or introversial it is your mind that violates them and this results in the degeneration of the unit consciousness because unit consciousness is reflected in the mind and nowhere else so ishwar paridhan means to move with accelerated speed towards that supreme shelter god therefore ishwar paridhan is absolutely based on bhav or ideation it is a mental effort in its entirety shouting at the top of one's voice for a big crowd to assemble or showing devotion by beating drums etc has got no place in it your ishwar is not deaf don't shout to convey your mental feelings to him one will have to detach the mind from worldly propensities while meditating upon ishwar first the mind will have to be withdrawn from the limited i feeling and focus at a point then one will take the thought of the macrocosm around that point with the help of the ideation of the mantra prescribed according to one's own samskar mental potentiality he is the subtlest entity therefore he can be realized only through feeling and by no other means perhaps you know that jap is of three kinds the attempts to attract his attention by reciting prayers in a lo- in a loud voice is absolutely meaningless respect affection sincerity and devotion are attributes of the inner heart and are not to be expressed loudly in the language of flatterers vaknik jap therefore serves no purpose however when a desire for vocal expression of an internal feeling is aroused the divine touch can be expressed in sweet language in the form of a verse or song as for example the mantra occurs to and to my mind mantras of this type are very good but they cannot serve the purpose of auto suggestion of ishwar paridhan verses or mantras uttered in such a low tone that they are hardly audible are called upamshu jap although this is better than vakanika jap it cannot be considered an ideal style of jap mental jap is the best process of ishwar paridhan once ideation should be expressed mentally and the mind should be its witnessing entity If this mental jap is practiced regularly and properly after learning the same form a competent teacher the mind will progress in a particular flow a forward moment on the path of pratisankara of brahma 
the speed of the mind generated by a sadhak by means of ishwar paridhan is faster than the mental speed of brahm by which he is leading his psychic creations towards perfection through the path of pratisankara when the mental flow of a spiritual aspirant moves along the introversial phase of macrocosmic meditation once animative force having the potentiality of divinity itself rises above all tendencies all sanskaras and proceeds towards eternal bliss in this state of mind is vibrated with cosmic feeling the unexpressed divine qualities of the higher glands find expression and the resonance of the mind vibrates the nervous system this gives rise to pious expressions in the physical body in the case of those people who occult feelings are not physically expressed due to causes associated with the nerves the mental vibrations cause certain radical changes in the various glands within the body these occult feelings are basically of eight types astounding trembling sweating hoarseness of voice tears horripilation change of color and fainting fit there are other feelings associated with these major feelings for example dancing singing rolling weeping roaring salivating yawning indifference bursting into laughter whirling hiccoughing relaxation of the physical body and deep breathing the probability of such signs is very little in the case of vaknik and upamshu jap that expression is very natural in case of those who have learned the correct process of sadhana these are associated with pleasure and not with pain of any kind therefore those who do not practice sadhana should not be unnecessarily afraid of these signs when such occult symptoms appear the sadhak also should not worry in any way in this state if the sadhak pay attention to expressing those signs their process will be retarded if they suppress their occult feeling their bhav or ideation itself will be disturbed and their minds will become detached from ishwar paridhan you should always remember that cosmic feeling is above everything else it is unwise to waste time paying attention to the external symptoms of the ideation or bhav these occult symptoms disappear as soon as the mind is detached from cosmic objectivity when sadhak attain the capability to establish themselves in cosmic feeling for long periods those ideations are confined to the mental body only and the physical body becomes calm to a great extent it is desirable to practice various lessons of sadhana alone in a lonely place but ishwar paridhan can be practiced both individually as well as collectively in collective ishwar paridhan the combined mental efforts work together and so give rise to the expression of the higher science in a very short time therefore like all other aspects of sadhana ishwar paridhan should positively be practiced alone in a lonely place but in addition to not miss the opportunity of collective ishwara paridhan whenever some of you conveniently meet together the indomitable mental force aroused as a result of collective ishwar paridhan will help you solve any problem great or small on this earth it is for this reason that you should always be jealous to attend weekly dharm chakra regularly anand purnima 1957 jamalpur shri shri anand murti ji